Hey, I want to encourage you. Make sure you're bringing your Bibles to church for a few reasons. One, so you can make sure I'm not making anything up. Right, 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 right. We don't want to freestyle. We want to go right through the text, right, right. And then two, that you can learn for yourself. That if you spend time here, if this is your home church, we're going to take you through the entire Bible. It's going to take us about 10 years, but we've got some time, Lord willing, right? But you'll be able to learn for yourself. You'll be able to read verse by verse for yourself. So before you know it, you're going to learn all of these uh, beautiful things found in the scriptures, and you're learning them for yourself. And uh, I'm excited about that because you're not dependent upon me uh, to teach you. We have the Spirit of God that teaches us. So bring your Bible so you can say, ooh, it's right there. Ooh, it's right there through the whole entire text. If you need a Bible, take the one in front of you. You just need really good eyes to read it. (laughs) But it's yours, but it's yours. All right, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 7, and then we're going to, uh, our main verses will be uh, verses five, uh, 5 through 7. And it says this, start verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 1. He says, Therefore I exhort, uh, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for who? All men. For who? For kings and all who are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Why do we do it? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our what? Our Savior. And what does he desire? For all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And this is our text for today, verses 5 through 7. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is it, family? The man, Christ Jesus, what did he do? He gave himself a ransom for who? For all to be testified in due time. And then lastly, verse 7, Paul says, For which I I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And the church said, amen Amen and amen. So uh, where we're going today, the, the first a uh, couple of minutes, we're going to tackle a whole bunch of scripture, but I'll have it on the screens for you because it's really, really important for uh, everyone, to, everyone to understand this. So if you're just jumping in on our journey, uh, the Apostle Paul, he has uh, told young Timothy, very young man, it's his first pastorate, he's told him, hey, you stay in Ephesus and handle all of these problems. There was disorder in worship, um, there were uh, unqualified leaders Uh, There was uh, materialism going on. So Paul is writing to Timothy to fix all of the issues. And now he's transitioned to what happens in uh, uh, personal uh, or uh, public worship in the church. So he now is going to transition into prayer as we began uh, last Sunday. And then this Sunday, he's going to talk to us about being Jesus being a mediator. So if you're taking notes, our first point uh, this morning is Jesus is our mediator. We, were, we read in verse 5, it says, For there is, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We could literally spend months on this scripture. We're not going to, but I want to give you uh, several verses on what the, Bible, what the Bible teaches. So let's tackle uh, verse 5. Uh, we learn, A, that there is one God. So the Bible doesn't teach that the uh, followers of Jesus uh, believe in three gods. We do not. We believe in one God existing in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So God the Father is not God the Son. God the Son is not God the Father. Uh, God the Father is not God the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not God the Son. So one God existing in three distinct persons. Let me give you several verses, and we'll take our time. They'll be on the screens, and we'll, we'll walk our way through it. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, it's called the Hebrew Shema, and it says, Hear, O, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, is one. Let me give you two scriptures from the book of Genesis. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. What does it say now? And the Spirit of God was doing what? Hovering over the face of the water. So hold on to that. Now, Genesis 1, verse 26. 
then God said, let us make man in our, in our own image. Who are you talking to? No one's there. Nothing's been created yet. This is God the Father speaking to God the Son. And again, in your Bibles, let us create man in our own image. And the Bible also teaches, as I mentioned earlier, that Jesus is also God. Jesus is God the Son. Let me give you several scriptures. Isaiah 44, 6. Jesus says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah 45, verse 5, the word of God says, I am the Lord, there is no other, there is no God beside me. Now you might say, well, okay, well, that still doesn't really prove that Jesus is God. Keep walking with me. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. What does it say? The Almighty. The Almighty. So if we were to look at Isaiah 44, 6 again, I am the first, I am the last. Then we have Revelation 1, 8, Jesus saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. We also have Jesus saying that I am the Almighty. Now you might say, well, how, does that, how do we know this is Jesus speaking? Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Everyone good so far? Okay. It says, and when I saw him, this is John speaking, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was what? Dead. Was dead. We know Jesus was crucified, but then he rose again three days later. And he says, And behold, I am alive forevermore. So these just a couple of scriptures, and the Bible is full of scriptures just like this that teach that there's one God existing in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let me give you just two more, and then we will, then we will move on. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, is the baptism of Jesus. So what we have here is we have Jesus in the water. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. When Jesus comes up, the Bible says, and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then the spirit of God descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. You guys remember that story? So here we have Jesus in the water, God the Father speaking, and God the Holy Spirit landing upon Jesus like a dove. One God existing in three distinct persons. This is really important for us to know. That's why we're taking so much time. That when someone comes to your door and says, well, Jesus was created, you're going to say, wait a minute, you've not read Isaiah chapter 44, that there is no God except the Lord. Then take them through the book of, to the book of Revelation where Jesus says, I was dead and I'm alive forevermore, that I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. Uh, Paul tells this to young Timothy so he can, uh, Timothy can teach the church uh, the blessings of praying uh, to Jesus and through Jesus. Our next point we're going to, we're going to learn is that uh, not only is Jesus is our mediator, but a mediator is one who stands between two parties and acts as a go-between. Maybe some part of your life you needed a mediator. You were mad. This person was mad. You couldn't solve anything. So he said, you know what? Let's get a mediator. And our type of mediator is a mediator says, or says well, I'm not for you, I'm not against you. I am just simply Switzerland. I'm in, the, I'm in the middle trying to help out both people. Well, the great thing about Jesus is he is the mediator between us and God the Father. Now, that doesn't excite you yet. Jesus is the goal between, between the sinful and the holy. That since you and I are sinful, we can't just do whatever we want. We can't simply go to God. Good to see you, brother. I'm glad you're doing good. Uh, since, we, uh, since we are sinful, you and I need someone to be the go-between. So God the Father is completely holy. So he doesn't just say, well, all unholy people just come to me. No, 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 no. He'll never change who he is. So we have Jesus, who is God the Son, who has put on human flesh like you and I, he is now our go-between. Now, this is so very exciting for a few reasons. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. You'll see it here on the screens. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. 
God the Son put on human flesh. Think about this. When we read in our Bibles that Jesus wept. (sighs) You know, when you and I cry, it's because there's some hurt in our heart. Eternal Son of God walked the life that you and I have walked, yet without sin. He got hungry. He got thirsty. Then he also cried. That's the greatness of our God where he's able to He's able to be sympathetic to our weaknesses, that our God is not far and removed and saying, I can't believe these humans can't live a perfect life like me. No, he, he's, he lived, lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, tempted and tried in every way, but yet without sin. And, and how great that Jesus is this, this go-between between the holy God and an unholy people. Uh, you men just finished the book of Hebrews So you will be very familiar with Hebrews chapter 9. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says this. It says, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, God the Father, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So this is letting us know in, in the Old Testament, if you're not familiar, so in order to... Uh, if, if, if you broke the law, if you, if you, if you sinned, you had to uh, ha- sacrifice an animal. So you can imagine today we'd be killing animals all the time, right? So, so the, uh, the, the animal sacrifice would, would cover your sin, but it wouldn't take it away. So go home today and lift up your carpet. You know all that stuff underneath there. It's just, it's just covering stuff up, right? <laughs> I know you're holy and we're in church today, but yeah, go home and go, ah, and put that thing down, right? Back to the message. So, so what's good about Jesus is he doesn't simply cover all our sin, he takes it away. So you can lift up the carpet as much as you want. It's clean, it's clean, it's clean. Not because we've been sweeping. It's not that type of clean. It's clean because of, of Jesus. Jesus being our mediator, he has taken away all were sins, not simply covered them up. The Old Testament covered up sin, but didn't take away sin. Jesus takes away sin. That's why we love us some Jesus, that he is the mediator between us and God. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one, that means nobody, can come to the Father but through Jesus. So, obviously, this is second service, so... I said uh, something earlier about um, having a different mediator between, uh, I think I, said, I mentioned that, yeah, Mary is not a mediator between, between us and God. And she's not, for a few reasons. Respectfully, she's dead, right? Dead people can't mediate for live people. Live people can't mediate for dead people. That's, that's what you guys are going, I'm not sure. Yeah, you, it's biblical, you, you, you can't do that, right? And we just learned right now that that there is only one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. So, so this is what you've just read, what we've just read. So how crazy is it that another religion where most, some of you, most of you came from, told you that Mary was a mediator? Where do you get that? You don't find that in the scripture. And again, not being disrespectful, but she is as sinful as you and I are sinful. And now that might be like a shock to you. Maybe you've heard that she was a perpetual virgin they lied to you (laughs) how do we know because in the gospels his family went to see went to see jesus and somebody said jesus your mother your brothers and your sisters are outside wanting to speak with you you're going i thought she was a perpetual perpetual virgin they lied that is incorrect we went to uh, a footsteps of paul trip a few months ago so we were in rome and we I went to several churches, and one of the churches we went to, uh, 
I like to just walk around and open doors. So I went back there in this, um, in the back there, there was a priest and people were lining up to, uh, to talk with him. And um, so I was just watching. This guy was allowing people to kiss his hand. I'm going, how crazy is that? Can you imagine me being outside going like this? <laughs> Welcome to Calvary Chapel Beaumont. Please uh, kiss the signet ring. Yeah. The crazy thing is, I'm sure with a crowd this size, one or two of you may, may, may go in for it. I was church today. Woo, I kissed the signet ring. I'm going to have a great week. Somehow my lips touching this ashy knuckles, you know, are going to bless me. And I was, I was thinking, on a serious note, I was thinking, I'm like, how can you as a man, a sinful man, allow people to line up and kiss your hand as if you are without sin? I thought that was the craze. I was like going... Look at these people. I was going, how crazy is that? And again, obviously, Rome is different than Beaumont. I, can, I, completely, I completely see that. But my, my issue was this, is that a grown, sinful man dressed in religious garb was allowing God's people to come to him as a thoroughfare to God. I'm going, how sad is that. So when I said what I just told you, uh, there's a, he's a brother, he's outside and he says, well, each time I come here, I get offended. I'm like, well, good. <laughs> he keeps coming back. <laughs> so, and he told me that, you know, he's, he's, in, he's in a certain religion. And, um, and I said, well, what's your wife's name? He told me his wife's name. And I said, so it's like me finding your wife's car, scraping it all up, uh, 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 giving her a flat tire, breaking all the windows, and then me coming to you to say, hey, tell your wife I'm sorry for what I did to her car. I said, why wouldn't I just go right to your wife? I've offended your wife. I've not offended you. So what this other religion does is they go to people then have that person go to God for them. Let me tell you this, family. God wants to hear your voice. God wants you to know him yourself. Keep coming. Keep coming to church, but... This should be done throughout the week. If this is the only time you were eating, your spirit's going, we are starving. Right? That, 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 that be mindful that there is no, no, no pastor is to take the place of your relationship with the Lord. And God forbid there's signet rings being kissed and, and all of these things. I thought that was the wildest thing that that man didn't say, hey, although I'm serving you communion, hey, I'm a man just like you. Ooh, what? People would find out that there's no capes. People would find out, ooh, there's no bat phones. They're, they're lining up to kiss the guy's ring. I'm going, oh my goodness. This is crazy that God wants you and I to come to him ourselves. And how do we get there? By our good works? Nope. By Jesus and him alone. We have a holy God and unholy people. There's no way to go. There's no way to get there. But Jesus is that, 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 that middleman, that, that, that thoroughfare. Now, the great thing about Jesus being our mediator is that he's the only one worthy to do it. He's the, he's the only one worthy to do it. That's why, family, we don't, need, we don't need trinkets. You know, we don't need dead saints buried in our backyards. We don't need all of these good luck charms. We, we have Jesus. Now, again, if this is offensive to you, Okay. Okay. The purpose of the truth is freedom, right? You shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. So imagine this. For years you've learned, I got to go to that guy. That guy is going to go to God for me. And then somebody's saying, hey, you know, uh, you, can, uh, you can go yourself, right? You know you can pray to God. Yeah, but I need that guy to do it. Well, why? Well, you know, he's, you know, priest of God and well, yeah, but you, you can still go without, without him. Well, I, I choose to go. Like, it's like me trying to fall in love with someone through someone else. I mean, it, it doesn't work that we have to, we, God has given you and I the, the, the blessing of getting to know him ourselves. That you and I can, we can, we can leave this place, not that, you, not that you should do it right now, but <laughs> we can leave this place right now, uh, go in your car 
and read the scriptures and have a phenomenal worship service between you and God. Because you, you have God the Father and you have God, you have God the Spirit leading us through the text. This is a beautiful thing where you don't, you don't need me. You got, your, you got Jesus, you got, your, you got the Holy Spirit. So here is like a, a so when you come to church, it's, it's, we're, we're all coming together to worship Jesus. We're all coming together to sing and to, to, to encourage one another. But you and Jesus need to have a one-on-one during the week where you're talking and you're confessing. And again, the Bible does say we can confess our sins to one another, which is biblical, but we also need to confess our sins to God. I was telling my brother outside, I'm like, hey, when you do something wrong, go to God and tell him you've done something wrong. That's Psalm 51 against you and you alone have I done this evil thing. So all that to say, family, the beauty of Christ is that it's him and him alone. There's no, our relationship is, 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 a, is a one-on-one relationship. There doesn't need to be all of these people and all of these things. So I'll just say, be mindful of putting, be mindful of placing people in the place of Jesus. Be mindful of placing people in the place of Jesus. Only one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the, the God man, the only one qualified. Next, we're gonna learn that Jesus gave himself a ransom. Verse six, it says, who gave himself a ransom for who? It says for, for all. We learned last week that Jesus desires all men to be saved. You will be delightfully um, delighted to know that this word ransom means a price paid to free a slave. A price paid to free a slave. The Bible says before we met Jesus, we were uh, uh, we were uh, uh, slaves to sin. Now the Bible says we're slaves to righteousness. So Jesus has set us free. We're no longer slaves. Now we're slaves to righteousness. But Jesus himself was the one who gave himself as a ransom for all. And how exciting that the holy gave himself for the unholy. You and I wouldn't do that. You know how, you know how we are. <laughs> Somebody's guilty. Well, you saddled that horse. You need to ride it. <laughs> You're guilty. You're completely guilty. So you know what? I can't help you out. You and I, complete guilt. And yet Jesus gives himself as a ransom. Jesus gives himself to, to set free you and I. To set slaves free is what Jesus has done by his death on the cross that Jesus is the bridge between God the Father and sinful man. It's Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10. So beautiful. Verses 17 and 18. He says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. He says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Listen to this. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. This command I've received from my father. So imagine this. Uh, Jesus going to the cross wasn't because Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Jesus going to the cross isn't because Peter denied him three times. No, Jesus went to the cross because he wanted to go to the cross. What did Jesus say? I could call, you know, a few uh, thousand, a legion of angels to save me. So Jesus willingly, family, offered his life, the holy for the unholy. He says, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. So Jesus is in the grave going, okay, is anybody going to help me? <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's day three. What's going to happen? He has the power to bring his life back again. Why? Because Jesus is the God man, 100% God and also 100% man. That's why we love us some Jesus. He gave himself a ransom for the churchgoer, for everybody, the churchgoer, the alcoholic, uh, the drug addict, the, the, the harlot. He's given himself for everyone that everyone can have salvation if they repent of their sins and choose to follow Jesus. Uh, that Jesus is for everyone. And what I mean by that is that Jesus has made a way for all of us to find transformation in him. That when you and I repent of our sins and turn towards Jesus, anyone can have salvation. Anyone can have peace joy and forgiveness if they turn 
to Jesus. Why? Because of the ransom that he has given for himself. How did his father view his sacrifice? Listen to Ephesians 5, verse 2. It says, And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. That Jesus' offering of himself was like a sweet-smelling aroma. In the Old Testament, when they uh, had offerings, it would uh, be said that it would go up as a sweet-smelling aroma. That it's the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you and I that the Father received. And I know we, 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 we don't always uh, fully embrace or receive all that Jesus has done for us. That we, we hear a word like ransom and we think it's for somebody else. We hear a, a word ransom that, um, that Jesus has come to set other slaves free, that I was never a slave, that um, Jesus uh, kind of gave himself for me, but not really. Uh, family, the truth of the matter is there was no other way to save you and I, but somebody had to give their life as a ransom. Now, the question is, since that's the truth, we need to say, well, who's worthy to give himself as a ransom? You've got to be holy. <laughs> You've got to be sinless. You've got to be God because only God is holy and sinless. That's why no other person fits in the spot of Jesus. So maybe some of you need to go home and throw some idols away. If you got some dead saints buried in your backyard for good luck, <laughs> dig them puppies up. Don't sell them. Put them in the trash and say, Jesus is just you and me going this way, this, this, this far forward. It's what I'm going to do to do with you. Why? Because you're worthy. You're holy. You're perfect. You're altogether lovely. And it's this, it's the sacrifice of Jesus. And um, Lord willing, all of you are followers of Jesus. If not, we're going to pray later on, but now, I know we all have some questions. My questions aren't what, what you might think. My questions are, Jesus, so, so tell me how you loved me before I came to be, right? Jesus, um, uh, uh, tell, me, uh, tell me how you were thinking of me when I'm not even here yet. Uh, Jesus, uh, kind of let me know how, how, you, how, you, how you worked everything out that, that I would be drawn to you, um, uh, Jesus, uh, tell me how, how your love for me, it didn't begin because you're eternal. So tell me of your love for me. I mean, these are the kind of questions I have that before I came to be, before, if you're a follower of Jesus, read Ephesians 1, that we were chosen from the foundations of the world. Before we did anything good or bad, for some reason, we were found in his love. Despite who we are, think about this, look at this, then we'll go on. God has always loved us. He's never begun to love us, but he has always. What do you do with that? That's why there's never any boasting. Ooh, I'm good, I'm great, I'm skilled, I'm talented. Wah, 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 wah. We are only here and where we are because of the grace of God. And his grace alone, we can never stand on any type of soapbox going, hey, I'm, I'm wonderful. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we have, we have, this is empty. All right, so, so we have holy Jesus, unholy us. God the Father says, I'm going to give them your holiness and your righteousness, and I'm going to take their sin and put it upon you. That's a glorious gospel that God would, would make this wonderful exchange, Jesus' holiness for our sinfulness, that there was this great swap that has happened. Think about this. The Bible says if you're a follower of Jesus that you and I are righteous in his sight. And we're unrighteous right now, right? right so we, 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 he's saying that the, the sinful man... The sinful woman in God's sight is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. That is simply so beautiful that all that we are is because of Jesus. All that we have is because of Jesus, that God the Father made God the Son to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. 
this is glory, family, that we can say, how great is God that my, my sins were as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be white as wool. That, that the, the greatness of, of God is this. He takes the sinful person and he clothes them in Jesus' righteousness. Now, you may not be excited about that, but inside I'm just going. <laughs> because we know that there's nothing that you and I can do to be righteous or to be holy. So what does Jesus do? He clothes us in his righteousness. That's why there's only one mediator between God and man, the one who clothes the sinful in his righteousness. He's altogether lovely. And who would, be, who would become sin for somebody else? That requires great love. To have our holy God become sin for, for people like you and me. And you know how rebellious we are. It's not like we were trying to do good. We were out there doing our thing. And what does Romans 5, 8 say? But God, what? Demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were what? Still yet what? Sinners. What did Jesus do? Died for us. You and I don't do that. We want to make sure, hey, if you're trying, please try. If I at least see some effort on your, on your account, uh, then I may, might bless you. Jesus says, the Bible says, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died. What do we do with that, family? It sounds a lot like it's not about you, but about Jesus. May our boasting always be in the cross of Christ. May that be our boast. May we never, uh, and, and, it, and it, hopefully you can catch yourself too, kind of spouting out your greatness. Close that up and say, wait, wait a minute. I am what I am because of Jesus. All that I have is, is, is because of Jesus. And, and knowing what you and I know now, this should make our prayer time exciting that a holy God invites unholy people into his presence because of the blood of Jesus to ask what we will according to his word. So the, the, the one that made the greatest, well, think about this, God the Father made a sacrifice in giving of his son. And then God the Son made a sacrifice of giving of himself that you and I have access to God whenever we want. I mean, like, any time we want. And when you're hurting, you can go to God. When you're joyful, you can go to God. When life hits rock bottom, you can go to God. And when life hits underneath rock bottom, you can go to God at any time... Hey, pastor, my life's falling apart. Can you pray for me? No! No, I cannot. Have you prayed first? Does it make, does it make sense, family? Yes. Well, for some of you, it, call me. I'll love you. Love you. But I'll ask you, have you prayed first? Have you gone to your Savior first? He wants to hear from you first. So God, bless my brother. They're going through a really difficult time. You go, go first. You, go, you pour out your heart to God first. Then have us accompany that prayer, but you go to God first. Always go to God first. That make sense, family? Yes. Good, okay. Verse 7, it says this. It says, Paul says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. Let's pause here. So a preacher is, is someone who heralds a message. Now, some of you might hear the word preacher and say, ooh, that's talking about pastors. No, 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 no. Everyone here is a preacher. Some of you are really good preachers on, on uh, social media. <laughs> you are heralding a message on social media. We want to herald Jesus on social media, by the way. Back to the message. So, and then an apostle in the biblical times is someone who was sent. But in order to be an apostle in biblical times, you would have had to see the risen Savior. So people today who call themselves apostles as their title, it's a little a, not a big a. There's no more thus says the Lord's apostles. No, the apostles today are, this is what the Bible says. Hopefully they're reading, reading that. So while you're watching your religious TV, kind of keep that in mind. Well, Paul says, well, I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. He says, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Family, when did truth become so bad? When did telling the truth become 
like this really difficult thing. Well, no, I don't want to tell them the truth. It's going to hurt their feelings. They need to know, but no, we don't want to say that. No, the Bible says don't judge lest you be judged. Why are we so afraid of the truth? The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. So the purpose of the truth is freedom. The purpose of the truth is freedom. And if you're a follower of Jesus, somebody told you you are a sinner and you need a savior. They didn't say, well, you know what? You pay your taxes. You're kind of good. No, they told you in order to come to Christ, you must repent of your sin. They told you the truth. And then here comes you and I. Well, then the enemy says, well, no, don't tell them that. You know, you're going to offend them. You know, the Bible says don't judge us. All these nonsensical things. When the purpose of the truth family is our freedom the purpose of the truth is that you and i would live lives free ask yourself this right now in your mind do you have any strongholds perhaps you might say yeah i got one or two then ask yourself why is there a truth you are not believing is there a truth you refuse to believe if i can come to your front door maybe somebody said several years ago you're not worthy of anyone's love. And that's been your thing. I'm going to make myself worthy of someone's love. I'm going to make, I'll, I'll get with this guy, which is horrible. But at least I'm worthy of someone. That's like, that's like your, uh, your, uh, your thrust in life. But that's a lie. Jesus loves you. But that's not enough, huh? That's not enough, huh? If the love of God is not enough for you and I, nothing else will you go from relationship to relationship to relationship and relationship. And it's not in my notes, so whoever that's for, Jesus is enough for you. Jesus is enough for, for us all. Paul is saying, I'm a, I'm a teacher of the Gentiles. He says, in faith and in truth. Family, we can't have one without the other. We can't have just, just simply faith. No, faith comes because of the truth. Faith comes because of the truth. Somebody tells us the truth found in Jesus Christ, and this is a beautiful thing. So we can say like this, tell me the truth, so hurt me to heal me, right? Hurt me to heal me. So we don't want to walk around thinking we're healed when we're actually sick, right? So it's like going to a doctor, and so you finally get in there after, you know, an hour wait. So how can I help you? Like, well, I'm having these these symptoms, and I, my, my, my leg feels like this, and my body feels like this, and this is what's going on. The doctor says, okay, I think you're fine. You're going, first of all, you have my $15 copay. <laughs> so you need to give me a couple of minutes to pay for that 15-minute copay, right? So we are not just leaving right now. So you, you, you go and you explain to him how, how you're feeling. You tell him that things aren't working right. You're not eating you're not feeling good. And he says, ah, oh, it's going to pass. You're going, no, 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 no. I, I need you to, to tell me what's wrong with me. What's great about the Bible is it tells us what's wrong with us. Then it tells us how we can get healed. And that's through Jesus. So it's like you go into the doctor and he says, okay, hey, go, hey, my bad. Go do these things and you'll feel better. Take this, these pills for seven to 10 days. And you're like, eh, I don't want to do that, doctor. He's like, well, you came to me because you needed help. This is the help I'm giving you. So if you're refusing the help I'm giving you, then why are you here? Sometimes us church folk can be like that. We come to church, make me feel good. <laughs> and then you leave. Well, we want to do more than make you feel good. We want to give you the word of God. Right? So we want to give you the truth that's purpose to set you free that you might live a victorious life found in Jesus. But if we're always going, feel good. Did you feel good today? Did you smile today? Did you laugh today? I mean, and, and, and I'm grateful that we can come to church and laugh. Church should be phenomenal, phenomenally uh, exhilarating. But there's times, pretty much every service, where there should be some, ooh, that kind of hurt a little bit. Yeah. Right? There should be some, ooh. I may not come back next Sunday. <laughs> there should be once in a while going, that guy has made me so mad. <laughs> you ladies, that'll be in two weeks, by the way. <laughs> we might empty the church out in two weeks. You're going, what does that mean? Well, keep reading 1 Timothy chapter 2, and you will find out shortly. Back to the message. 
Um, all that to say, family, is be, be, be mindful that we're living according to, to the scriptures. He says a teacher of the Gentiles in faith, in faith and truth. He's, he's telling them not only how to live faithfully, but he's giving them the truth. And can you imagine God saying, well, you guys aren't really that bad. Jesus didn't really need to die for you. No, he lays, it, he lays the truth out for us that we might, we might receive truth. And let's say this too, and then, we, then we'll go. We don't have to preface truth. I mentioned it before. It's kind of like when you know the truth in someone's life, but you never tell them. Then they mess around and make you mad. Then you say something like this. Do you really want to know the truth? Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever, oh, you guys are too holy today, huh? You're like, eh, no, 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 put that hand down. The thing is, you've always known what their problem is. You've always known. But you're like, oh, let me just tiptoe through this thing here. Then they messed around. They made you mad. Then you said, you, you really want to know? You really want to know why your life is cyclical all the time, why you're always doing this? Let me tell you. Why didn't you tell them that at first? Why wait until you get mad? Like somehow now being mad validates the truth? The truth should lead. The tr no, amen answer that. <laughs> you're like, well, that's kind of a, that's kind of a lot, path. The truth should lead. How wonderful would it be to have someone in your life that you know will always tell you the truth. You need to have at least one friend like that. Because everyone else will be like, oh, it's okay. But then go to this guy, go to this girl, and you know they're going to tell you the truth. How invaluable is that to have somebody that's not going to dress a lie up to make it look really good, but somebody to say, you know what? That's sin, that's wrong. Jesus loves you. Make the changes you need. God will give you the help to do it, and let's go worship. That's a beautiful thing, because just maybe God is going to use you and I and his truth to set someone else free. That's a beautiful thing. Somebody told us the truth, and that set us free. So if the truth set us free, the truth will set other people free too. God, give us the courage to speak the truth in love. Because some of you hear about the truth, you're like, oh, don't you know that duh, duh, the Bible says? And you... Yeah. You need to use a little grace in that, right? Uh, we should not use the truth as a hammer, right? Jesus came in grace and truth. He told us we're a bunch of stinking sinners, but we are saved by his grace, faith through grace. So it's important, family, that you and I Follow uh, this pattern here. So Paul was a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses uh, 1 and 2. He says this. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, he says, I did not come with the excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, and what a... Oh, what a beautiful foundation to stand on. It wasn't his speech was excellent. I have this, you know, golden tongue and, you know, I'm mesmerizing people with my great speech. He said, no, 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 no. When I came to you, I determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul didn't, didn't preach, you know, six ways to be blessed in AD 64. You know, he's not uh, looking for a best life. He's telling them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was his focus. That should be the focus of every single church, preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our, the church as a whole, we are so far off center. It's crazy. It's almost like a counseling session for 45 minutes. Come, lay down in a pew, and let me tell you how great you are. Turn on your, turn on your TV. Count how many times they, they, they mention sin. Because you mentioned sin, you're going to offend somebody. If you offend somebody, oh my goodness, they're not going to tithe. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? Like God's going, ooh, they're offended. They may not come back. Ooh, if they don't come back, they're taking their money. Well, really? That's our concern. Jesus, help us. The truth must be taught. It's God's truth. So you ladies remember that in two weeks. Right? <laughs> it's God's truth. 
But that truth is meant to set us free. Let me give you two things to take home with you. The first one is, um, what is the benefit or benefits of Jesus being our mediator? Talk this over as you're going to lunch and later on tonight. What are the benefits? Make sure you list all of those, and then it'll be great when you list all of those. Then as you go to pray, look at your list. Look at all those benefits. You're going, man, because Jesus is my mediator, I have this access, this means this, and this means that. So exciting. And then secondly, uh, why did Jesus need to give himself as a ransom? Father, we are overjoyed with your love for us in giving us your son, Jesus, that you have made your son who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God, that you've, you've justified us, that your son has justified us and made it that just as if we've never sinned. But yet here we are working this thing called life out. And Father, there's a lot of things that we don't understand but what we do understand, we just rejoice. We rejoice in you. We don't lean on our own understanding. We're, we're grateful that Jesus has died for our sins. We're grateful that in your eyes, in your presence, that a sinful man, sinful woman, that, that we are clothed in your son's righteousness. That's just simply wonderful. Father, forgive us for boasting about our knowledge and our wisdom. May we, like Paul, only boast in the cross of Christ. Jesus, you are great and wonderful. The power that you have to save and transform a life is simply, simply wonderful. And if you're here today, friend, then, and I'm not asking you if you're religious because being religious will never save you. But I'm asking you, do you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship? I want to encourage you today, if you don't, to, to begin the relationship. I know you have all of these questions. The first one is the most important. What have you done with Jesus? What have you done with the one who has died in the sinner's place? and in exchange has given you his righteousness if you were to follow him? That's the question today. So if you desire to have Jesus to be your savior, let's you and I pray a prayer. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if we believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sins and rose again the third day, we shall be saved. This is, this is Romans chapter 10, that, that Romans road. So let's you and I pray, pray together. And if my hopes are that, that, that you mean it, that this is a, a time where, where, where God has just been drawing you to his son Jesus to, to save you and to, to tell you the truth that God is real. Jesus is real. His spirit and his work in our lives are real. He's got a plan for all of us. Will you receive Jesus today? And if you desire to receive Jesus, if you're inside or outside or online, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins and to rise again the third day. I'm calling out for you to save me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Deliver me from me and deliver me to you. I commit my life into your capable hands. I ask these things in Jesus' name. And if you, you said that prayer and you meant it, the Bible says if any person, any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. That's what our God does. He makes all things things brand new that's what jesus does follow jesus read your bible have fellowship come to church and serve and give unto the glory of god thank you for being so wonderful we love you because you first loved us we ask these things in jesus name the church said amen, amen and amen